Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I will make a promise that I will not offend any Catholics in this chapter. Chapter 14, follow after charity. Okay, we just discussed what charity was all about, chapter 13. It's love and action. Desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Right? Seek charity. Next, prophesy. What is witnessing all about? Is you're telling a lost man where they're going to go if they don't do what God tells them to do. You are telling a saved man what will happen to him if he does what the Bible tells him to do. It's all prophet. The entire Bible is all prophecy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now let's get this down for our charismatic idiots, our people. We are talking about language. Spanish, French, English, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Hebrew, Greek. Hebrew, Greek, Spanish. So, if there was somebody here right now who spoke French, I would not have any idea what he would say, but God would. Now, what advocation would that be? Some of you people may get this video in a place where there's no English, and maybe there's subtitles. But if there's no subtitles, you're just going to hear me speak and well, for what? What's that guy ramping and raving and screaming about? I don't understand what he's saying. Unless he's going to get an interpreter, as we'll see in a moment. Then, oh, okay, I understand. For no man understands how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. No one knows what you're saying if they don't know the language. We're not talking about a heavenly tongue. We're talking about two languages since the Tower of Babel. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. First, First Chronicles 25.1 I prophesy to lost people and to saved people so they will grow, they will know, they will get what God's word says. And again, if I were just my of my heritage that I have of mine, I really take the, the respect of being Polish. My grandpa used to speak, he used to tell me he spoke Polish. I don't know. If, see, I don't even know if he did or not. I don't know if he was pulling my pulling my leg or not. He may not have. I will never know if my grandfather, when he said he was speaking Polish, if it was true Polish. Why? Because I didn't know Polish. And if I start speaking Polish, I might not even be speaking it right. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. You know, you see where the Pentecostals go, well, because you don't know what I'm saying. It's a holy spiritual tongue. No. It's not. It's gibberish. But he that prophesied edifies the church. Do you realize if these Corinth, the Corinthians came here right now and started speaking white they speak when Paul wrote to them, it would be a, an unknown tongue to me. Because they're not going to speak English. And yet when Paul writes his letter to them and they read the letter, it will be for edification. Because it would be in their language. I would that ye all spake with tongues. Okay. I'd like to have you have a second, third, fourth language. But rather that ye prophesy. So, okay. So remember verse 13 of chapter 13. And now by faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of charity. Okay. Now among tongues and prophesying, I'd rather have you have prophesying. Charity and prophesying. Your love being sent forth as action would be to tell someone what they need to do before either judgment comes. 
but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesy than he that speaketh with tongues. So why is the charismatic group putting all this effort on tongues and receiving the Holy Ghost when Paul says that's not the greater? You want to do something in the Pentecostal movement, tell me what my future is going to be according to the Bible. And this is where you get to tarot card reading and all that too. Don't you realize that? Well, this card means... How do I know that card means? I didn't study it. I have no idea. These tea leaves say... I don't know what the tea leaves... See, even those things in, in uh, witchcraft and flamboyance and all that, that's a tongue to the person who's sitting on the other side of the table. I don't know if you're pulling my leg. You can make it say anything. But... Okay, we're talking about telling the future. No, I'm not talking about telling the future. I'm telling you, tell me Bible prophecy what God says is going to happen. Because what most of God said has already been fulfilled. And most of it has been fulfilled. That that has not been fulfilled will be fulfilled 100%. I want to say we know what God said. Except for he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So if you're going to speak in an unknown tongue... A heavenly tongue, you got to have an interpreter. And these meetings that the holy, you know, tongue movement, there's never an inter interpretation. And a lot of times, a missionary will get up when they're visiting the church and they'll say something in the native language where they are. And then they'll tell you, well, this is this verse in the language I'm doing, or this is what Jesus, so they will tell you what they just said in the language where they are. That's perfectly what, what Paul says in 14.5. If you're going to say it in another language, then tell the people what you said. That the church may receive edifying. Oh, okay, that's that verse where he goes. And something like that, you can almost recognize how the name of Jesus is pronounced. Like, you know, if you find a verse that has Jesus, you can see how it's pronounced. A verse that has God. You learn something. A lot of languages, you know, it's almost spelt the same. It even sounds the same. When you say Jesus in Mexican, well, what's Jesus? That's Jesus. So you learn something. Bibla. What's a Bibla? Uh, 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 something to put around a, a baby's neck in Spain? No, that's the Bible. Bibla. You learn something. Now, brethren, save people. If I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? See that? Look at that. And Paul was rehearsed in many languages. Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. There's the three things. Revelation to show you something. Knowledge to let you know something about the Bible. Prophesying with future events according to the Bible. Or doctrine, which is teaching. Tongues has nothing to do with it. Now, there are some churches on Sunday, they'll have an afternoon or evening, sir, where the church is Spanish or it be Polish or it be Italian. What? Because the congregation can't come to the English service. They don't understand it. So they would come to the service where their language, and that's perfectly good. That's perfectly right. You put the languages together so they can get from the Bible. That's proper. But if you're walking a congregation where there's all one language and you bring another language, that's mayhem. Unless you tell them what you said. Because a lot of times it's going to cause you in doubt. I'll be at a restaurant, you know, I'll, I'll say, hey, can I have another soda? And then they'll start, you know, the Chinese restaurant, they'll start talking. I'm like, you guys talking about me because I interrupted you? or What do you guys think about me? Why are you talking? What are you saying? Sometimes the race is, what are you saying? And even things without life given sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what a, what is pipe or harp? Musical instruments have their own sound. You can tell the difference between a guitar string and a trumpet. You know what is being played. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound. 
let's say somebody banged the trumpet up and, and bruised the trumpet up and he goes to blow it, it ain't going to sound like a trumpet. Who shall prepare himself to battle? So sounds have a markmanship of, you can tell by somebody if they are in agony, if they are in tears, if they are happy, if they're sad, if they're down, if they're tired. Your sound, the vocals that come out of your mouth, they show what you are feeling, most likely, as musical instruments. But if you come in speaking a language that no one knows, well, what is that? That does not do anything. A man in a pulpit, he can preach a message. Man, he can get up there screaming and hollering and showing love and then have tears and then sign. He could do all that and make the message excellent. And then he can step up to that pulpit and speak a language nobody knows in the congregation. You're just sitting there like, huh? What was that? So likewise ye, except ye uttered by the tongue words easy to understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. <laughs> so evidently what's going on in the Corinth church is there are people getting up and they're speaking their language and no one has any idea what they're saying. Again, it's not just Holy, Holy Spirit, heavenly language of God. Corinth was a seaport. Everybody from the known world would come in and, and be in these areas that Paul started churches. That's why Paul chose these places. They were vast amounts of difference of people. And evidently they were allowing in the church people to come in and speak and they'd be like, oh, what's that? It's almost like Paul is saying you need one language in the church. Your home church needs one language. But God had to do away with that with Babel because when they all got together with one language, one mind, man, God says that the iniquity of their hearts and thoughts. Language distinguishes us so we don't sin. I forget which chapter that is in, in Genesis. Man, they were going to build their own tower to God. They were going to do everything against God. But There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world. And none of them is without sophistication. Now, I got this down. This was done last year. In the modern world today, there are 6,800 to 6,900 languages known. And with those, let's say, 7,000 languages, they all have their purpose. The people that speak that language and write that language knows what that language is. The problem is the other people in the world do not know. You know, it's, uh, I'll give you an illustration. I think it was, I think it was Brother Holt. Or um, I can't think of his name. He's, he's in Africa too. Oh, I can't think of his name. When they were translating the word of God to, to the people in Africa... They, they had a they had a problem because anywhere it says white as snow, Africans have never seen snow. So they had to change it. I think it's some kind of nut they have there that they use instead of instead of snow, they'll use that nut. You you go speak in Africa and you know, snow you preach a message about snow. You lost them. They have no idea what snow is. So not only is this language like French, Spanish, English, and all that, you've got to have words that the people you're talking about know what you're talking about. You can't have, Paul says, I have not used vain words. I have not used sophisticated words. You've got to come right down to the simple, basic words that the people will understand. The Bible does that. Bible, many people understand gardening. Many people understand fishing. You may not have to fish. But you still know the basis of fishing. You may not garden, but Jesus knows and God knows you had the basis of garden. And those were the things that Jesus used in his illustration. He didn't go into thermal nuclear dynamics and he didn't go into crosswords of the doctor and, and lawyer vocabulary. So another thing with, with your language, with your tongues, it's got to be simple. 
for the people to understand. If you use big long words as DDs and post hole diggers and all that do from the pulpit, lost. Like one of them that always gets me and, and it just trills my, my fingernails. I may not even say it right. I don't care. But when they talk about the judgment seat of Christ, they talk about the beam of seat of Christ. What the heck is a beam of seat? Just shut up. It's a judgment seat of Christ. You just try and make yourself look up, look better than what you are with your title. It's a judgment seat. People understand judgment seat of Christ. They did not go to school for beam or whatever it is. And Yahweh. People don't know what Yahweh is. They don't speak Hebrew. Get off the Hebrew. We're English. You see that a lot in prisons. They know all these big words. And Paul is saying here, no. You don't do that. Don't speak Hebrew when you're not Hebrew. God has given us certain Hebrew words that he wants us to know in Hebrew. He has given us certain words in Greek that he wants us to know in Greek. Other than that, the rest of the Bible, 99%, I would say, is in English that we've been reading. The other 1% is all the names that we got to read. Now, that's not English. So, when you're dealing with somebody, you're dealing with a lost soul, you don't deal with a, a Christian to grow. Use simple words. And make sure you're talking the language they're talking. It would help. Therefore, I, therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. I have no idea what, we, what, what we're saying. And that's a running gag of television. You ever see a television show? You got one guy, he's speaking, and he comes up. He's, he wants to know a question, so he taps somebody on the shoulder, and he starts out, oh, I want to know how to get to the polls. And then that guy is speaking another language. And these two are going out for 15 minutes, and it's a running gag. They don't understand each other. And that's what Paul is saying. Even so ye, ye, the Christians, Corinth, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gift, man, they want those gifts. They want to speak in tongues. They want to be charismatic. And Paul is determined them not to be. How's that? When was the last time you think 1 Corinthians 14 was rightfully preached in a charismatic church in the King James Bible? Seek that ye may excel to edifying of the church. Tongues does not edify the church. You get right that and mark that one down. Prophesying did. Verse 3. Prophesying, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Not tongues. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Oh, Lord God, I can't, I can't meet with these people. If I got anything to say, Lord, help me to say it and then say so they can understand what I'm saying. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying. And that's where the charismatics will jump on that verse. Well, you know, from the spirit, we're doing... No, 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 no. You're just fleshy. You just want to be seen. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and will sing with the understanding also. And there are some songs... In the hymnals that church is saying, I don't know what they're saying. Uh, at least money. No, what is that? A Riva. No, that's. This one, I think one of those Christmas songs. And there's, there's a word in there. I don't know what the word is. Starts with a D, I think. I won't sing it. When we come to that word, I'll stop right there. Or any word that looks foreign to me, I'll stop. I won't say it because I don't know what I'm saying. I have no idea what that word is, and I won't sing it. And I believe by 1 Corinthians 14, I believe I'm doing right. If you got such a big word in your hymnal, you come across, you don't know what you're doing. Go look it up before you say it. You may be surprised to find out what it really means. 
else. When thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he, the Holy Spirit, that occupieth the room of the unlearned, say amen at the giving of thanks? Imagine you pray in unknown tongue. Well, how's the Holy Spirit in that congregation going to say amen to someone else? If they, what was that? And we of America, we've seen this out in the public. We've heard people speak another language and have no idea what they said. And more frustrating is when you get on the telephone and you call a number and you get connected to India. Okay? Now you understand what I'm doing. Now it's not only confusion, now there's obsession. And then you ask to speak to somebody who's who's over them who can spell, speak English. And, they, oh, well, okay, well. and then you get somebody who speaks even worse. Isn't that confusion when you have to deal with somebody like that? Well, that's what 1 Corinthians 14 is. You do not go into the church and speak Indian to them. You go over to India and speak to Indian. That's what it's all about. And you know, listen, I've talked to many people. I, my last job was about about the, 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 the telemarketing and all that. And people hate that idea of having to talk to that language. 1 Corinthians 14. You will bring into that church a hatred. You will bring into that church a spirit of confusion. You will bring in that church a spirit of giving up. Seeing he understands not what thou sayest. So, one time we accidentally we walked into a black church. There was no problem like that. But imagine me walking into a Spanish church. Sitting down. You know, okay, we're here. Not going to make a scene. And then every time the preacher says something in Spanish, the whole thing is done in Spanish. Amen! I don't know what I'm amen into. I can't agree with the preacher. I don't know what he's saying. Can't agree with the person. I don't know what he's saying. Whether he uses a language or he uses big swelling words. For thou verily giveth thanks well. You did it well. You did it well. But the other is not edified. Now see, that's not about yourself again. You can thank God in your words, and if somebody else doesn't get the thank and blessing out of it, it did nothing. And we already read, yeah, you prayed to the Spirit, you prayed to God, God understood, but the other person didn't. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now get that and lay that on a charismatic. Believe on Jesus and be saved. I don't even give you uh, big words of uh ministry schools and like that he says listen five words would be good enough that you can understand more than ten thousand in unknown tongue brethren christians again be not children in understanding how be it in malice be ye children but in understanding be men you know let, let, let your failures be like innocently but when it comes to being christians be men in the law it is written uh oh going to the law with men of other tongues and other lips will i speak unto this people the gentiles the hebrews all spoke hebrew and yet for all that will they not hear me saith the lord there was a mess in, in acts chapter 2 with everybody from all parts of the known world, and they're all speaking in tongues. But everybody knew what they were saying according to their testimony. 
Wherefore tongues? Okay, and you gonna get this one. Let's see. Let's, let's, I think it's back here. Chapter one. Run to chapter one because this is a fun one. Go to First Corinthians one twenty two as I read this next verse. We're gonna have fun with twenty two. You got a charismatic tongue believing and all that. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. One twenty two. For Jews require a sign. And just take one look at it and say, I know you're not Jewish. The Bible says that what you're doing is for a sign. And the Bible also says that's for Jewish. And I'm looking at you and you're not Jewish. Now, want to have some more fun with them? Back to 14. Are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. Okay. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. <laughs> A person that speaks tongues for other people is witnessing the lost people, according to Scripture. I wonder what that says in other Bibles. Tongues are a thing God gave for the Jews. Go back to the book of Acts and find it there. And the Jews did not believe. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Prophesying. There we go. That's the key. Charity and prophesying. And many in Acts did believe that the Holy Ghost spoke in tongues. No, I mean, I mean, in general, the Jews didn't believe until they heard the tongues. And they're like, well, wait a minute. These guys are of God because look what they're. I mean, in Acts chapter two, they were amazed. They're all. These guys are drunk on grape juice. Remember what, that was a comment? Because they all spoke their life. And then they realized, no, wait a minute. Yeah, this is real. And then tongues would be throughout the apostles showing these Jews. Hey, it showed Peter with Cornelius that Cornelius and his family were, were now saved. The Gentile had to show the Jew, hey, it's real. So, and we're pointing at prophecy. It can help a Christian and it can help a non-Christian. You get somebody comes up to you and says, I don't want to go to hell. I, I, man, you can use prophecy to, to lead them to glory. You can have somebody come to you who's a Christian and say, I don't know what to do. I, I really want to please God. You can use prophecy, the judgment seat of Christ. Talk about rewards. And listen, the whole study of Jesus Christ is prophecy. All the prophecy that he fulfilled is a great study. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Oh, these people, blah, blah, blah. Almost reminds you of Acts chapter 2, wasn't it? These guys are, what is going on here? Drunkards. That's exactly Acts chapter 2, verse 13. But if all prophesy, there come in one that believes not, or one unlearned. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. You get up there preaching. Well, I'll tell you right now, one of these days, heaven and earth are going to fly away and burn up with a fervent heat. And everything that is to be there is that is, is, will be no more. And that guy who's never been to church, I'm like, I understood that. I understood that. He may not believe it, but he understood what he said. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of the truth. So prophesying will bring some way to repent and get right with God and give God the credit. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm. All right, psalm. Has a doctrine, a teaching. Has a tongue, your language has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done 
unto edifying. Edify, make the church well. Help it to grow. Somebody's got one one hymn that, that's on their heart to sing. If it's for the glory of God, let, let it be chosen. If it does not defraud the church. If a man has a doctrine to teach and it doesn't upset the Bible, let him teach it. If he's got the tongue that all can understand, let him do it. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three. And that by course, and let one interpret. That's the rule. And you don't see it with the charismatic movement. When they speak their tongue, there's no one telling you what they're saying. It's an unknown tongue to everybody, anybody but Satan. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. So if you got a language and all that, and there's no one else going to, you speak to God, God will understand you. God will understand your Spanish, your French, your Mexican, whatever. God will understand you, even if the church won't, can't. Without an interpreter, you sit there in that service and you pray and talk to God. But the people will not understand. Let the prophets speak two or three. And let the judge, let the other judge make check, make sure what they said is correct. Don't get up in that pulpit with a message and then say to the whole congregation that Jonah never died. Somebody should have stepped up and said something. Don't get up there and say, "Well, Isaiah, there was two Isaiahs. Moses didn't write the, the I mean, all the other junk." Say what you have to say, and then if you said it wrong, let other people judge you and then correct it. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. It's an orderly. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comfortable. Well, wait a minute, one by one, all? Looks like the entire church is given the chance to speak. At least those that God has spoken to. And if he's wrong in verse 29, well, let it be judged and let it proclaim what was wrong. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion. And the subject is tongues. So when you see somebody, God is not the author of confusion, the context is tongues. An unknown tongue is confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God is not for a bilingual church unless there's an interpreter to interpret what's being said. I bet you 34 and down is probably out of your Bibles. But let's read it. Let your women keep silent in the churches. Colon. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. Semicolon. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. There Paul's quoting the law, saying, as the law. Women are to be quiet in churches. They're not to stand up and say anything. As we just talked about, if the prophet speaks, let him be judged uh, for all the prophets one by one that they may learn. And he says, women, don't say anything. Don't say anything when it comes to the prophesying in the church. Don't say anything when it comes to uh, uh, tongues. A lot of charismatic tongue speakers are women. Now, does that say that a woman is never to speak? No. She's allowed to witness. But when you when you got something prophesying, when you got church service going on, it's an orderly fashion. Now watch this. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Ooh, husbands, you better be getting ready, Peter says, to give answer at any time. 
Don't let your wife rely on the preacher for her questions. Don't let that woman rely on somebody else. That woman should rely on you, on, on the Bible knowledge that God's given you, that she can do fulfilled. You're in charge of your wife. You're only in church three hours, if that, a week. And the one that she's supposed to be under as a man is not the pastor, it's the husband. Again, when these women keep in silent, the main context is tongues. Then we have a little bit of a, a revelation and prophecy. But it says in 23, therefore would the whole church come together. That would be just probably just the assembly. Listen, those women, when they went to the wells to get water, they talked. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. I wonder how that one's done. Especially when you get a woman that's in the pulpit. I wonder how that one's read in women preacher at A woman's not to guide, and the thing is, I mean, you can't talk to other women in the nursery. That's not what it's about. We read scripture of scripture, she's not to assert the authority over man. She's not to get in that church and teach men what to do. That's wrong. Now, what about a nursery school? What about a Sunday school? Are any of those students a man over her? They're usually children. And they're usually not in the assembly either. They're off in another classroom. I mean, there's a lot of ways, a lot of things I've seen these verses pronounced and written about. But, husband, I'll say one thing, though. If your wife's got any questions, you better answer her. And if you can't answer her, you better, you better go find the answer for her. You'll be held accountable because if it says let let her let her ask her husband at home, and that verse going by like that, and if you don't get an answer for her husband, you're going to stand liable at the judgment seat of Christ for not taking care of your wife. What came the word of God out from you, or came out unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. All right, don't get too boastful. Don't get too proud. Get your head out of the clouds. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. I mean, you're not going to learn. You're not going to listen. You're not going to do it. Just stay a fool. But if you think you're actually spiritual, you think, you know, you got the knowledge, then... Make sure you see that it's what Paul and what the Lord has commanded. And if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to do right, then be angry. Wherefore, brethren, okay, covet to prophecy. Isn't that interesting? Because one of the big laws was thou shalt not covet. And Paul is saying covet to prophecy. How's that one? If you're going to cover anything, you want anything, prophecy. There it is. Now, this is not the prophecy we're going to date the Lord's rapture and this earthquake in Middletown, nowhere in East Desert of this country. This means the Lord's coming down. That's not that. And all these books you can find in the market. No. There's, pr there's plenty of prophecies from Genesis to Revelation for you to study. And one of the prophecies for you to realize and study is that God said certain things we're not going to know. So guess what? You're not going to know. And forbid not to speak with tongues. Right, don't stop it. Don't stop the guy speaking in tongues. Upon the rules that we've given. If he walks in and he's got an interpreter or he can interpret himself, don't stop him.
let all things be done decently and in order. And that's the motive should be written on every church above the pastor's head. Church is to be orderly. Chapter 14, verse 33. God is not the author of confusion. So when you got a church service, it's utterly chaotic and, and, and this mind-boggling world has pointed. You're violating the scriptures. What would be another unknown tongue of decently in order and God's not the author of confusion? What, what would be? We talked about, you know. Spanish, English, and all that. We talked about big words that people don't know. What would be another form of tongue that would confuse the church? We've already read part. What about a hymn? What about if you bring music into the church house that is just not spiritual? Rock and roll. Rap. And all the other junk they got out there called Christian. That confuses people. The lyrics confuse people. Their lives confuse people. And that's definitely not orderly. How about when the Bible speaks about against drinking? Wine's a marker, strong drink is raised, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And then you have a church who has the teenagers come, and I've seen it, and they have an alcohol bar. Or at least some of them are non-alcoholic. And the Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. See, there's all kinds of things that the church can do and do recklessly and with confusion. And it can be put under that title of tongues that other people are not going to know what's going on. And when you've got such a worldly church like that, and they see your church doing things like that, they're not going to recognize you from any other worldly church. Because you're just like them. And you're supposed to stand out as a Bible-believing, Christ-honoring church. And when you put church on your sign and you live like the world, that's confusion. And that's not done decent in order. When we put a church sign out in front of our building, it ought to be that we stand out because if somebody's really searching at that moment, there is something in their life that they got to seek God, they will know exactly who to go to. And if they got to bypass 40,000 other churches to get to that one orderly and decently ordered church without any confusion, they ought to know who you are. I mean... Again, the old gag is you're in another country, you ask somebody for directions, and they don't know your language, and you don't know their language, and it's a running gag.